according to John. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commands and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. The Gospel of Christ. Jesus, open your word to us. We come thirsty for that living word. Amen. We're going to be talking about bridges today and uh, bridge building. Uh, and I'm afraid also about burning bridges. I'm going to begin by telling you a little bit about my week. I went midweek and I just returned quite recently from going to Guelph. And I saw a lot of family, my brother and my sister, my mother and my father, and they're all dear to me. They have a place in my heart. I love them, and in a way, I carry them around with me. My mother was very sick with pneumonia, and some of my family thought, my brother and sister, that this might be the beginning of the end. At 91, it just was going not well. So I drove to Guelph, to the home I was born in and raised, where my mother still lives, knowing I might need to call also my children to come and see their grandma for a final time. What happened was very different than I expected. My mother had been telling my sister and brother, and I think she'd be okay sharing this, because she says it all the time, even when she's well. She says, I'm ready to die, and she asked God to take her. It was time. She couldn't connect with why staying here, here was good, with nothing to do but deal with the uh, aches and the pains, the medications, and she was very tired. She had a horrible cough, and I really think she was depressed. <clears throat> so I believe she must have experienced all of this, and I'm glad that she could be vocal, and we have to remember that it's good when people tell us honestly how they feel. Well, I wheeled her. We, in our living room, we have a big picture window, as some of you have, and if you're fortunate, it looks onto some nice landscape, and she looks right out to our front lawn. So I wheeled her, her wheelchair in front of the, of the window. She was coughing badly and sort of slumped. And I said, you're going to direct me. We're going to do what, what my mom, favorite thing to do. If I said, Mom, you had all the health in the world, do you know what she'd want to do? weed to pull out those dandelions. So I went outside and I cut the grass and I asked her to direct me and I kept running inside to where to prune the forsythia and then I got down to the weeds and I'd hold one up, it had a nice long root, started going like this, pulled one up, no root, like that. When I noticed she stopped coughing, she was sitting upright, she looked alert, she forgot that she was very ill and that she was dying. And what I think happened there, and we do this for each other all the time, and others have done this for my mom, and my mom has certainly done this for me, is we kind of built a bridge for her to get her back into her life. To, to get, if this was the time, even then, we would have liked to build a bridge for her uh, to be in a good place where she was. And also, Jesus builds bridges for us. And at nighttime, when we pray together, uh, I just sort of gently reminded and prayed how wonderful it was that indeed we had Jesus as a bridge that walked with us, and as our reading says, never leaves us orphans. Yesterday a dear friend shared with me his efforts to help a youth through the sudden death of his best friend. Suddenly a friendship that bonded them through all those things that in your youth are so intense and life-shaping was gone. His best friend was dead. 
So that hurls you into a tunnel that feels deathly. Fortunately, my friend is incredibly gifted at building bridges, and while nothing can sometimes lessen the shock of grief, there are all kinds of ways we can build bridges in crisis. Getting someone just to laugh a little, a cup of coffee, a prayer. One of the ways that in my childhood, and now you can think about your childhood and how your parents did that, but my father would build a bridge for us by literally play, playing board games. Did some of you do that? Yeah, you probably played some of my favorites. Sorry, Snakes and Ladders. My favorite was one called Bridges. And I'm curious, did anyone play the game Bridges? Oh my goodness, I think i got to bring it to church. Okay. Well, the object of the game is going to be obvious to you. You build a bridge, um, and the first one to build a bridge over your opponent, it's a two-person game, um, is the winner. And of course, one has to go this way, and one has to go that way with little, little, little bridges that snapped into place. And while you could do that very simply, and sometimes you were shocked, suddenly you or the other person had a bridge built that was fairly straight, you can imagine how complex these bridges became as you tried to stop your opponent from getting their bridge built first. But what happened was you were relentless about it, and nothing would make you give up in the face of so many obstacles. Could we bring this same kind of enthusiasm and stamina sometimes to building bridges in our relationships amongst nations, amongst churches, amongst people and family and friends? I saw that happening when we invited St. Hilda's and St. Luke's to use our facilities. That was a neat kind of bridge building thing that we did. Building bridges literally is hard work. Yet the role they have played, and now I'm talking about the structural ones, in human lives and development is immense. Many years ago, my daughter, and I don't know if some of you have this project, you have to build a bridge with toothpicks. Is that a common thing? I don't know. And it, it apparently it has to withstand all kinds of weight, well beyond that you could imagine. So we were busy with that, and in the process she learned about uh, structures, and one of the things they were teaching in the history of bridges is that you work with the materials that are at hand. So that's why some bridges are wooden and some are steel, all kinds of things, because they come from the community that, that surrounds them. And at the same time, no one should underestimate the value of a good old-fashioned plank or log in a pinch when expediency is paramount. We've all watched those movies where either the bandits trying to get away or the good guys escaping the bad guys come to a place where they are trapped <coughs> unless a bridge can be made to the other side. And at the same time, these characters may well burn their bridges after their use so their pursuers are cut off from catching them. The log is dislodged, the dynamite is set, or the bridge simply weakens and has a timely collapse. Well, if you look at our first reading, you might want to look again and see what Paul is doing because he is building bridges and he's very successful. We meet him on his second missionary journey. He has crossed Asia Minor, which is modern Turkey, and he's arrived in Athens. Now, there's a lot that is similar with Athens and uh, St. Thomas and the wider community. We embrace London as well. Uh, in, that, in that, we have a university, we have theological colleges, uh, and just as in Athens, known for divine and an openness in conversation about divinity and about philosophy, it's got a thriving market with a lot of shopping and theater. And Paul is now in new territory where he's unknown. And his way of introducing himself is a wonderful example of bridge building at <coughs> its best that so we can all take note. Paul is not only a stranger, he's with people who don't particularly care for him. In this university town of intellects, there are many ready to challenge his words. He is not one of them, and he will have to prove himself. In fact, there's this 10th century illumination, and, and you can see clearly that Paul is being mocked uh, by this very audience. Now, the name that the people call him when you translate it from the Greek is literally babbler. That would shut me down. I don't know about you, but if I hear you saying, stop babbling, I'm gonna, don't, don't get any ideas. Um, you know, we're going to tend to move on to someone who might appreciate what we have to say, even if we're sharing a long story. But, of course, if God places it in our hearts, like God did to Paul, to speak, then we would go on and we'll take the heat. The Greek word of derision used for Paul, um, also in the exegesis, 
is close to an old English expression you may have heard of called the cock sparrow, meaning a person who picks up scraps of what they find around them, much as a male sparrow picks up the odds and ends of straw and twigs he finds to build a nest for his mate. And it's clear that Paul is doing just that. He has not come to speak philosophy. He was picking up, though, what he could and struggling to give body to his ideas and in so doing was truly making use of the materials that he found around him, of what was at hand, uh, to build a bridge of understanding between the Athens philosophy and Christianity. And even though Paul, a traditional Jew, would find few elements in the Greek religion or poetry with which to feel comfortable, it's really clear that he's taken the time to read their poetry, and he's taken note of all the statues, and then look, what did he notice? There's one to an unknown God, and that's his bridge. He says, I noticed this, let me tell you about it. I actually have met that God. Well, now they're listening, now they're interested. And he goes on to talk about his experience of Jesus Christ, not in a didactic way at all, but a way that says, I'm in your culture and it's intriguing, it's interesting, and, and, and I, I want to talk about this element of it. And he meets them there. And as we know, at that point, many did become very interested and uh, wanted to know more about this Christ. And Paul had done so with respect. He had not burnt bridges, he had built a bridge. Now it's really unfortunate that many times in the church history, we burn bridges. We've gone into a culture, not cared about it, uh, to learn and understand it, to meet people where they are, uh, but instead to be very didactic. And, uh, and that's not what Jesus did. Do you notice how Jesus made bridges? The parables. He talked about farming. He talked about marriage and relationships, uh, father-son issues, all kinds of things that he knew uh, mattered to the people. Fishing. And that's how he made bridges into their lives, and then they could also receive that way they knew that he cared about those things and had paid attention, and then he could share with them. Well, you and I are bridge builders, and all of us know, through bad experience, that it doesn't help to build a bridge with someone in your life if you are blaming them, or you denounce them, or criticize. That'll turn them away. What do you do when someone criticizes you? Do you sort of give them a hug? Uh, do you want to engage more and say, spend more time, Let's, let me buy you a coffee? Most of the time, what happens is it breaks down. What could be really exciting and good if we could get past that kind of way of, of relating. And so I think that's a lot of what today Jesus, who was, if you had to sum up in one word, why did Jesus come? It was about reconciliation. He wanted to reconcile us to God and to each other. And that was his work. And to do that, you build bridges. And that's who you and I are. And I do believe that in many ways St. John, John's does it really well. I saw it in our food and hospitality ministries. Our Lenten series, we studied the Paschal Mystery of Christ, but we also opened up the wonderful music of Leonard Cohen. And so many people uh, relate to him and came to talk about him. And in talking about him, we talked about all kinds of things about life that matter to God as well. It's not about, also look at how many ministries we have here with people that come and do ministry. Uh, we have this place, the place where people feel healing, who can share openly about their struggles or addictions. Uh, this is a place where people are doing Zen-like things to, to center themselves and to um, take care of their bodies. We don't do it for profit. We do it because we know that here is a way to build a bridge with our community, and that is what Jesus wants us to do. And so we value these things. Why we, that's why we consider outreach, and we keep growing. And I would like to challenge you that sometimes we should just get out into the neighborhood and build a bridge by knocking on a door, or leaving and then saying hello. We don't need to do a whole bunch, but just to say we're here, and how are you, and I'm your neighbor. When, yes, we could be walking, playing golf or walking in the park, but that's another way we can build a bridge. So let's take what we've heard in these two readings and in our reflection of our own lives and ask ourselves some questions. You know, do we, do we tend to too hastily move into the burning bridge mode? Do we shut down rather than open up? 
conversation, a relationship. There are times when you do need to walk away, when a, when a conversation has become toxic or a person become toxic. Even if it's short term, sometimes we can't build a bridge right now. We have to wait for the right weather, which probably a bridge constructor would say as well. There's a lot of things that go into making a good bridge. So that's the gift of the Spirit that we're given, that is coming to the disciples and is given to each one of us. We do have discernment in that process. We need to ask Jesus if we find it challenging to build a certain kind of bridge. That's what our diocese is saying to us. Are you building bridges? Are you reaching out to your community, sharing your good news, listening to others' good news, sharing in that way? Building bridges with our partners, our families and friends. Those who challenge us, it's good work and worth the effort. So I leave us with this invitation. How can we do this? How can we do this every day and enjoy it and know that it is good work? Amen.